LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com The suggestion is that the function of the brain and nervous system and sense organs is in the main eliminative and not productive. Each person is at each moment capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. The function of the brain and nervous system is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment. According to such a theory, each one of us is potentially mind at large. Most people, most of the time, know only what comes through the reducing valve and is consecrated as genuinely real. Certain persons, however, seem to be born with a kind of bypass that circumvents the reducing valve. In others, temporary bypasses may be acquired either spontaneously or as the result of deliberate spiritual exercises, or through hypnosis, or by means of drugs. Through these permanent or temporary bypasses there flows, not indeed the perception of everything that is happening everywhere in the universe, but something more than and above all something different from the carefully selected utilitarian material which our narrowed individual minds regard as a complete or at least sufficient picture of reality. In the final stage of egolessness there is an obscure knowledge that all is in all, that all is actually each. This is as near I take it as a finite mind can ever come to perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and today we present part two of our interview with Tom Campbell discussing some of the ideas in his My Big Toe trilogy, Awakening, Discovery and Inner Workings. In this episode, we delve into unseen realms, the nature of existence, the origin of the universe, and that which lies beyond. Was the Big Bang real, and if so, what lay behind it? Has something bigger than the Big Bang always existed? If not, can nothing exist? If nothing real can be truly infinite, where does infinity end? Are the ultimate origins of time and space themselves non-physical? Is our reality virtual, our universe a simulation? In asking these questions, the limits of human knowledge are also probed. Simply put, we can never know what we do not know. Hello and welcome Thomas and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you Greg, I'm glad to be here. Uh, Thomas, today we're going to be doing uh, very much what we did last time, which is expanding on some of the ideas in your trilogy, My Big Toe, Toe, T-O-E, standing for Theory of Everything. The three books are Awakening, Discovery, and Inner Workings. Um, I would suggest that people get into the interview that we did previously. The link uh, for that can be found on this interview page. Uh, before we dive into all that, though, just do, once again, for people who are coming to this fresh... Tell people a little bit about your background and your work in general. Okay, I'll keep it short since we covered all that uh, in the first uh, sure, session. Sure, sure. Um, I'm a physicist, and I've worked as a uh, professional, you know, I, I say real world. I worked in physics in the real world, that's opposed, that's as opposed to academia in physics uh, since about 19, 
72 or so is when I got out of graduate school. And about the same time, 1972, uh, I got connected with Bob Monroe, who had built a laboratory for the study of consciousness. So I've had a dual career in physics and consciousness research since 1972. And uh, once you start in a path like this, either the physics or the consciousness, it's not something that you give up and, and, and uh, decide to go on to something else. It's a, it's a, um, a thing that you get your teeth into and, con and study consistently just all the time. So my consciousness research has always been uh, you know, part of what I do, and so has my, my physics. Now, what I've done is written three books, a trilogy called My Big Toe, T-O-E, Theory of Everything, and it's my, not because I'm so proud of it, but it's mine because if it's not your truth, you know, it's, it's uh, well, I should say, if it's not your experience, then it's not your truth. So My Big Toe is just a, kind of the launch point or a, uh, a focus point for the reader to build their own big toe that based on their own experience. So that's why I call it my big toe. And what it is, is a, as it says, a theory of everything. But that everything includes the subjective as well as the objective. It includes the paranormal as well as the normal. In fact, paranormal just becomes a, a part of normal. It covers um, physics. It does better quantum mechanics. It uh, explains why um, particles should be described as probability distributions, and there's really no, no other way they can be described. That's just a natural artifact of the way reality works. It uh, explains why C is a constant, which is the fundamental um, idea that you need in order to generate uh, special relativity. And it uh, describes things like you know tunneling and, and quantum mechanics, the uh, entanglement. All that sort of thing become perfectly clear. They're not mysterious, uh, weird science anymore. They're just, they're just plain uh, good old physics once you understand how the nature of reality is and how reality works. So that's kind of what I've done. So it, it also explains metaphysics you know, as well as the physics. So it explains, you know, philosophy, uh, why are we here? What's our, what's the point of our existence? Uh, where do we come from? What's the source? And all that sort of metaphysical stuff that is typically done in uh, either philosophy or theology. So it does um, actually explain everything. And I'm looking for things that it doesn't explain, because if I can find something there, then it means the theory is not complete or it's not right in some way. And either it needs to be you know, adjusted if it can be or abandoned if it can't be. So that's the way science works. Theories are living things. They um, don't claim to um, you know, know everything for all time. And if they do, they're probably not very good theories. The other thing about this theory is that it only has two fundamental assumptions. Because you can, you can, have a, you know, you can build up a theory that will explain anything if you're allowed enough assumptions to make. So with 10 or 12 or 14 assumptions, you, know, you can... Uh, well, what was the thing on the uh, on the internet? Uh, something about the spaghetti monster. Um, I can't remember now, but just somebody doing a, ton a tongue in cheek uh, uh, on religion, and you can explain anything if you have enough uh, assumptions. You can win any hand in poker if you have enough wild cards. You know, it's the same sort of thing. So this only has two, and that makes it a very elegant theory where uh, you start with two assumptions, and after that it's just deductive logic until you uh, end up with an explanation of everything. So that's kind of who I am and, and what I've done in, in very short terms. And we talked about that last time. So if any of your readers want to get filled in, go to the last uh, episode here of this, or I guess it was the first episode, and or you can go to my books, which are free on Google, or to YouTube, where I have about 130 videos. All my workshops and so on are, are uh, free on Google to take a look at. Tom, when we first connected and talked about uh, talking, um, I had a plan, but that quickly went out the window. Actually, after our first interview, <laughs> I realized that there was uh, I couldn't impose a structure on this. Overall, today, I want to get into unseen realms, origins, 
uh, the nature of the universe, beyond that, in fact, beyond beyond. Um, but one thing, a general point I want to make, and this is partly based on some of the feedback that I had from our first interview, is that when we consider you know, life, the universe and everything, the big questions, uh, why we're here, uh, where we come from, where we're going, there's the issue of the limits to knowledge, human knowledge. Mm-hmm. And yes. we have this idea, uh, you know, we're kind of the apex of everything, the peak, and uh, given enough time, we can know everything. And uh, there's a nice little point you make in the book about bacteria and what they might know about us. You know, could they conceive mm-hmm. of, of you and I? And if we transpose this upwards, we arrive at uh, at you and I and what we could perhaps know about that which lies beyond. And it's a very per- pervasive idea, as I mentioned, that given enough time, we can know everything. And that uh, although last in the last interview, we addressed the idea of the, you know, most of the information being in the, the kind of nonsense that that was it still persists now that okay yeah we we accept that you know the victorians didn't have all the answers and darwin and newton and all the rest of it but going forward it's only a matter of time before we do ultimately have uh, we do have information about reality that is that is fundamental and i think if we can begin to accept that that and it's very difficult for us to do, I think, but that, that, that this is fundamentally actually misplaced faith in knowing yes. everything. Yeah, that that, that will really, uh, that can actually free us. Yes, that is that is the case. And, of course, it always is crystal clear when you look backward because you've been there. When you look forward, <laughs> there's nothing but fog. You see, you can't see very far because you don't know what you don't know. So, you know... Your ignorance remains dark. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, black energy, right? Uh, dark energy. It, everything's dark when you look forward because you haven't been there and you have no idea what lies ahead. And you look backwards and you know everything that's been there for as far as history goes. And when you have this kind of a viewpoint where the future is dark and the past is well illuminated, you kind of have the idea that we've, we've been there, we've done that, there really isn't much left to know. That's just because we, we see all this information from, from the rec- you know, re- history when it was first recorded up to the present time, and we see all that information that's gathered, yet we can't imagine what's ahead. So we fall into the assumption that there isn't all that much ahead. We just about know everything, and uh, we have... Uh, just about reached the pinnacle of, of knowledge. But there is, as you say, a fundamental, logical exclusion on what we can know. There are some things, and it's not just because we're not clever enough, it's that they are just unknowable. Um, there's a couple of ways of saying that. We are consciousness, okay? So we cannot get outside of consciousness, because that's what we are. You can't ep- step outside of that. Um, you can't see the very origins of consciousness, because in order to see the birth of consciousness, you'd have to be outside of consciousness. You cannot see yourself being born, you see, because you don't exist yet. So you can't objectively watch yourself being born. You can hear accounts of it. You can compare it to others. You can do that sort of thing. But you cannot know what comes and how it is you got to be at the very origin because we weren't there yet, you see. So in that case, you have to start with an assumption. You cannot just, you know, know everything deductively from the beginning. It doesn't work that way. And yes, I have this example in my book that the, the, the bacteria in your intestine, in your small intestine, they have no idea what you know, uh, nuclear uh, fusion in the sun and the warmth that it gives here in the rain and all of that that makes plants and refrigerators and trucks and tractors and all that sort of stuff all contribute to the food that those bacteria do see. And from the bacteria's viewpoint, that food is just manna from heaven. It just kind of appears and comes down the pipe. And what they do, their job is to process that food. Okay, They decompose it, pull out the various nutrients. Their job is, is decomposers. Now, where does that food, that food come from? How would they know? 
given a bacterium with an IQ of 200, you know, uh, how could that bacterium know about sunshine and rain and light bulbs and refrigerators? It just can't. You see, it's just outside of its ability to understand that. So that's the way we are. You know, we can't, we can't see the birth of consciousness because we didn't exist. We are consciousness, and we can't get outside to see that objectively. Now, we can look at telltale signs like here we are. We're conscious, so we must have existed. You know, we do have a, an origin story someplace because here we are. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you kind of devolve to the idea of infinite series. You know, that, there, that the, what was before that, what was before that, and you get into an infinite series of explanations. You know, each thing doesn't know what its thing is, so there must have been something before it. Yes, and if you explain that, there must be something before it, and so on. Uh, it doesn't mean that. It just means that you don't know. There's no infinite series implied. It just means you're ignorant and will always be that way. You know, another way of looking at it, uh, you cannot watch yourself being born. You know, you could say a camera can't take a picture of itself. Uh, of course, we're not talking about mirrors or anything. We just mean a camera can't take a picture of itself because it's the thing that takes the picture. Um, it's just a, you know, a fundamental logic. Uh, a simulation cannot, um, you know, create itself. It has to be created by someone else. Because the simulation didn't exist before it was created, therefore it can't create itself. You see, this is just a, a fundamental piece of logic that says we have limits on what we can understand. And we see that in our physics a lot and in our science. Look at biology, okay? We have a Darwin's theory of evolution, and it's, it's spread and grown quite a bit since Darwin's time. And it starts from a cell. Given the first biological cell, logic can tell you how that cell multiplied and changed, became a multi-celled thing, became uh, a cellular thing of many, of many uh, independent components, you know, multi-functional, became you know, something like us. We can trace all of that uh, and see that it all makes sense. But we have to assume that that first cell existed. We can't go beyond that. In physics, we have cosmology. It starts with the Big Bang. The Big Bang is when a, a very uh, relatively small ball of high-temperature, high-pressure plasma begins to expand. Well, where did the plasma come from? How did it get there? Well, it couldn't have gotten there from our universe because our universe didn't exist yet, you see? So it's the same thing. We start with an assumption that there is this ball of plasma, and from there, we can logically you know, deduce everything else, how the universe became the way it is. But that ball of plasma has to come in as an assumption because you, if you look at your origins, you can't see beyond your own birth objectively. You see, so it, it works that way in, in all things. So my theory starts with an assumption that consciousness exists. And not consciousness the way we know it now, but just a primordial, very vague, kind of dim consciousness. And we have to start with that, and then we can logically show how, you know, all the rest of the world, our physical world, you know, like I say, uh, relativity, quantum mechanics, everything will fall out of that assumption plus one more. And the second is that evolution exists. Evolution just being a process that, you know, you... you you try whatever's possible, and what uh, works stays and builds, and what doesn't work just goes away. So that's the, uh, you know, that's basically what uh, what evolution is. It's just a, a, a process of a self-changing, self-organizing things. Well, modify themselves, be it purposely or randomly, and if the modifications are good, then they persist, and, and you can build on them. If they're not good, if they don't, uh, say in biology, if, they're, if they don't cause the entity to be any more survivable or uh, aid in their procreation, then they're not functional from a biological viewpoint. In consciousness, they have to uh, decrease entropy of the system because consciousness is a digital information system. And if they help decrease entropy of the system, 
then they you know they go on that's good if they don't if they increase the entropy of the system then they just die because they're dysfunctional so evolution exists and consciousness exists from that everything else follows including our universe including that ball of plasma and including that first cell all of these uh, now become uh, something that we can that we can understand but we're always stuck with that first assumption and we'll never get past the one that's that's basically consciousness because that's what we are and we can have a pretty good guesses about some of the, about the others so that's that's kind of the the idea that knowledge has its limits fundamental theoretical limits about how much we can understand about the world and yes we think we not only almost know everything but certainly that we we can know everything in in time and that's just not the case some things are beyond our knowing this gets to the heart of a key question really and it's kind of a partner to the original one that i mentioned about you know the limits to knowledge when considering ideas about the big bang and the origins of of all that is and of course the idea of the big crunch that you know some time uh, who knows when that uh, all will cease to be um i've spent most of my life i don't know how long you spent doing this but <laughs> i spent most of my life considering what came before what is and can can nothing exist you know what does nothing look like and it's only relatively recently that i've considered the idea that something has always existed now as much as the idea of nothing is an assault on the intellect the idea of something always existing it seems to me for for most people is probably an assault on the intellect as well i mean we we really struggle to conceive that yes you know the the, the quandary that you're in is that if you say that not, you know that there was a time when nothing existed then how do you get something out of nothing and if there is something that always existed then where did it come from you see it uh, you have these these impossibilities you know they're, they're logically you can't answer either one of those so you're kind of stuck with either way you go that nothing existed and we popped out of nothing or that what we are has always existed Neither of those are intellectually satisfying. Both of them have to start with an assumption, and that's the very thing we're just talking about. You know, we, we can't go beyond a certain level. Now, we can go back, uh, you know, quite a ways as far as w how we understand, say, just this universe, because just this universe is just a small part of the larger reality. So we can look at this universe and say, well, where did that ball of plasma come from? And we can show uh, why that ball of plasma was, was uh, created, why it was created and how it was created, and how this universe then came from that. That sort of thing we can see, because that is a subset of consciousness, you see. We can look at the things that are subsets of consciousness, but we can't look at where did the original consciousness come from because that's outside of our of our knowing so that's why we get in that we get stuck in that neither answer works well and it's like well it had to be one or the other but neither one is very satisfying and that's because we just don't know that there's it, you can't get a causal you know some kind of logical causal system that'll answer either one of those two um, roots that is that you know we can't we popped out of nothing or we always existed there's nothing causal behind it you just start there well if you're going to start there instead of starting with uh, uh you know with one of those two beliefs it's better just to uh, limit yourself to the minimum assumption that you can make and start with that i don't even know where to begin with diving into your concepts that you formulated to try and consider these questions i mean uh, should we start with uh, talking about the idea of absolute unbounded oneness or absolute unbounded manifest? Um, is that so? Is that something that people can consider? That we, you know, given that we talked about already, or do we talk? <laughs> do we talk about, as you mentioned, evolution, the fundamental process, and and entropy? I mean, the entry point to this is, uh, I guess, thinking about these ideas brings home very sharply uh, what we opened with talking about which is the you know limits to knowledge well you know way the way i got to it 
was I started with with uh, this research in, in consciousness and with a basic understanding of physics of how the universe works. And as I experimented in consciousness, as I did research in consciousness, I kept uh, seeing uh, bigger and bigger pictures. The more I understood, the bigger the picture got. And eventually it got back to the point of a larger consciousness system, that consciousness was fundamental. And at that point, when you say, well, where did the consciousness come from? That's when I realized that we're not, be, we're not going to be able to answer that with some kind of causal uh, uh, you know, logic. It's, it's a point where we can't know anything more. So then I started with the assumption that consciousness exists. And when you start with that, you have to always use the minimum assumption. Not that consciousness like we know it exists, but I said consciousness, and I, and I realized that, that this consciousness system and that our physical universe was fundamentally information. That's what it reduces to. When you take it down to its simple level, it's just about information, and science is getting there. Most, you know, I shouldn't say most, but uh, there's, a, there's a, a large number, probably a, a very large um, minority of, of uh, physicists who believe that our reality, our physical universe, is based just on information. It's computed. It's a virtual reality. Um, probably every physics department in any university on the planet has some physicists in it who thinks this is the better idea because that's what the experiments over the last 50 years, that's what our experiments are telling us. So if we start there, that this is an information system, and I understood, I came to the conclusion that consciousness was an information system before I realized that you know our physical reality was also an information system. And that was just from my research. It just acted that way. As I got more and more data coming in about the nature of consciousness, it just looked more and more like it was information-based. So I started my theory with saying that, okay, what we need to start with is an assumption that there is some awareness, some vague, very vague awareness that can be in uh, that it's aware that it can exist in one of two states. It can exist this way or that way, two states, and that they're, they're, they're discernibly different. And that's where my assumption starts of consciousness. Consciousness now is this, this uh, primordial consciousness is a, an awareness, a dim awareness that can differentiate its being in two states. Well, those two states then become a one and a zero. Okay, now that's the beginning of, of the information, right? State one and state two is information. And then as it evolves, because that, uh, uh, because information, even in such a simple system as just that that I've described, information survives by creating content. And that, in general, is called reducing entropy. More structure, some, uh, you know, order. That's what information is created. If you have no order, you have randomness. If everything is random, there is no information. Randomness has no structure, no content. There's nothing there but randomness. So if you impose some order and structure on the ones and zeros, if you will, or on the bits, then you get content. You get information. Just a pattern can be information. You know, information doesn't have to be a you know, an, an English sentence, information. If you have a pattern that goes up, down, up, down, up, down, what's the next one in the pattern? Well, it's going to be up. Because you've, you know, if you look at that pattern, you can tell that's information is in the pattern. And it tells you how to progress the pattern. So, we have then our beginning, our origin, is this, this primordial awareness that can determine two states. And it evolves because being able to determine those two states makes it an information system. It evolves to where there's multiple ones and zeros. This way, this way, this way, that way, that way. All right, that's, you know, three zeros and a one. Well, you can make patterns out of zeros and ones. Now, also, with this assumption of consciousness, comes in as a, as a necessary logical condition, time. Because if you have a this state and then a that state, well, you've just changed states. That's time. 
change defines time. So it was in this state, now it's in that state. See, so a before and after defines time. So with the assumption of this consciousness, this uh, awareness, this vague awareness, automatically time comes in. Okay? Now, also, choice, the eye of choice comes in. It can choose to be in this state or that state. Okay? If you have choice, you have free will. If there's no free will, there's no choice. So all of these, this, the free will, the time, both piggyback on the assumption of consciousness because consciousness, free will, and choice are all logically necessary for each other. In order to have any one of them, you have to have the other two. And so we start with this system, and as it evolves into multiple ones and zeros in its consciousness, now if you want to say it's in the in its mind, it's in thought space. We're not in any kind of three-dimensional space. This is just a a, uh, a non-physical space, if you will. Okay, so then it evolves, and it evolves patterns and patterns of patterns, and eventually, all of this information and content that it's that it's evolving, the structure, um, it realizes that there is a another way to evolve, give a whole new dimension in its ability to construct information, patterns, and structure, and that is regular time. Now, we had kind of primordial time that's just defined by change. But if you can change states from a 1 to a 0, then you can change them back. You can go 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and that turns out to be a metronome. That's the timepiece. So that's the first clock, if you will, just a, a piece of this system now we have many ones and zeros, and you just take a piece of it and you oscillate it regularly so that you now have regular time. And suddenly, besides patterns, you have sequences of patterns. You see, that's another whole dimension in which the system can now build structure. So regular time, then, is a technology created by consciousness to help it evolve. It evolves by decreasing its entropy. So that's, the, that's kind of where we're going. Now, the next step is, and it's the same step that we've seen in biology and, and other places, and that is we have this monolithic thing now, this, this consciousness. It's one big lump of consciousness, and it has just created time. It has lots of patterns and patterns of patterns and sequences of patterns, and it realizes that it's kind of limited as one thing. If there were two such things, they could interact because both would have free will and there'd really be no telling exactly how it would interact because you'd have two things with free will interacting with each other. So it splits just like that single cell thing did in our biology. It needed to reduce its entropy as well because it was limited what you can do with one cell. So eventually evolution would have it. It splits and now there's a two-celled thing, a multi-celled creature. And it splits again, and you have, you know, you have lots of two-celled or three-celled, and then ten-celled, and then a hundred-celled, and you build up these these things that are multi-celled. And then the next big uh, uh, evolutionary break is that these multi-celled creatures start to, uh, what do we, what is it called in biology? They start to uh, specialize, and now you have specialized groups of cells, such as the locomotion part, the digestion part, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, defense part, all of these things. And then there's some part that uh, kind of controls everything, keeps it coordinated part. So we have now these differentiated cells that are specialized, and that is where we are. You know, we're one of those, right? All the, all the mammals and most of the frogs and reptiles and jellyfish are all have specialized parts that do various things. So then that was another big step up in reduction of entropy. The, amount, the, the kind of things, the kind of critters, the kind of information that can come out of that is vast compared to just a single monolithic thing. So consciousness did the same thing. It realized through its evolution that if it split, you know, when I say it realized, I, I don't necessarily mean that this was an intellectual process at this point. It's just evolution, you know, just using words like it realized. It's like you might say, that first cell realized that it should split, not that the cell's thinking about it and decided it was a good idea, but just that evolution um, you know, 
tries everything that's possible, and the winners keep going. Well, this is the same way. We're just talking about evolution now. So it breaks into pieces, and then it breaks into more pieces. And now there's lots of individuated units of consciousness all interacting with each other. And the novelty, the ability to lower entropy just suddenly grew immensely from that. And that's what we are. We are an individuated unit of consciousness. Now, we needed to reduce our entropy as a system because that's how we survive. If our entropy starts to increase, that means our system now is taking information, turning it into randomness, and the system is dying. And if that continues, the system goes completely random, then the system is dead. It no longer exists as information. So this information system is aware and it needs to survive, and it does that by lowering its entropy. That's why we have this, this pattern. Same thing for the biological cells, you see, same kind of situation. Now, it's not just magic that these two situations are the same. You'll find out that this whole thing is a process fractal. Now, you've heard of geometric fractals, where you take a little geometric shape or a little geometric equation line, and you start building on it. You start, so you start with a triangle. You put no, other kinds of triangles on each face of that triangle, and then other triangles on their faces, and so on. You keep building it up just out of a this simple geometric shape, and you can end up with very, very complex and intricate uh, designs, very complicated things that really have no end. You can just keep building on them and building on them. Well, evolution is a process, not a not a geometric shape. And evolution is a process such that the output, what evolves and, and stays, gets fed into the input, evolves more. So it's a, a process where the output feeds back into the input and creates a new output. That new output goes back and evolves more, which means you put it back into the input of this uh, engine of evolution that, uh, that takes place. So when you have that, you end up with a process fractal, not a geometric fractal. And process fractals work the same way. So we end up seeing these processes repeated over and over again throughout, uh, throughout nature. We see the, the uh, result of a process fractal. All right, I've kind of jumped around a little bit, but let me do one last step. So now we have all these individuated units of consciousness interacting with each other, and they evolved a, a, a way to communicate, okay, some sort of uh, communications protocol. That's called a rule set. It has a rule set. So they can interact within this rule set. Once you have a rule set, that's what defines a virtual reality. A virtual reality is basically information that operates within a rule set. That's the virtual reality. Take uh, World of Warcraft. Okay, there is a rule set that says how the elves and the monsters and the barbarians and everybody else, what they can do and how they interact. Rule sets basically define energy exchanges, they, how anything can interact. So within that rule set, then your elf and the barbarian move around, they interact with each other, they interact with the landscape, uh, you know, and with, with their, whatever is there. So it's information that is uh, limited or constrained, I should say, by a rule set. Well, the first virtual reality was just the consciousness, and it was constrained to express itself through communications, through a language, so that these individual pieces of consciousness could communicate, because that's what information systems do. They share information. They pass it back and forth. But this is a very slow way to lower entropy, just passing information back. Imagine... You're in a chat room with 100,000 other people, and there are no rules, just that you can chat. Okay, now you're supposed to grow and learn from this. Well, how do you do that? You don't know. You don't have any context, you see, from the, from the messages. There's no continuity. Everybody can connect or disconnect and, and say anything they want, true or not true. So it's just a, a jumble of information without context. What was needed was a different kind of virtual reality that had more rules, a tighter rule set that would create context. What they needed was a good schoolhouse 
so that these individuated units of consciousness could interact with a tighter rule set that provided feedback for their learning. So now it wasn't just calm going back and forth, but they could see the results of the things they, they did. How did it affect others? They'd get that back as feedback. And how did what others said affect them? And, and all of this would be a multiplayer game, and that's why we we have this virtual reality. So what happened is that this larger consciousness system, which had been evolving and was quite quite uh, a ways along now with all its individual units of consciousness, needed a tighter rule set virtual reality. So it created a rule set, and you know this it's an information system. So it is a it is a computer. You know it can juggle ones and zeros. That's what a computer does. So it said, let's come up with initial conditions. Those initial conditions will be a tight little ball of plasma, high temperature, high and you know high uh, pressure, and we'll contain it. And we come up with this rule set that says how things in this virtual reality can interact. Then we push the run button, and that's the big digital bang. That's when the simulation that we call our universe began to run in this computer within consciousness. And so it developed and evolved. Now we have simulations today in computer science labs and universities that start with initial conditions and they evolve. They are continuing to evolve. Evolution is an open-ended process. It doesn't end. You keep feeding the output into the input and you get new things. You see, so there's really no end. Unless you come to a place where there's actually nothing else that can change, but the more complex they are, the less likely that is to happen. So this was a big virtual simulation of our physical universe. Started with the Big Bang, virtu uh, Big Bang um, you know, virtual reality in a computer. So there's where that ball of plasma came from. You see, it was just initial conditions in a simulation. And the bang happened. How did that ball just sit there constrained until suddenly it, it expanded in the big bang? Well, it sat there as initial conditions until the run button was hit. So now we have this virtual reality. And eventually this virtual reality evolved and evolved until we had a single cells and multiple cells and, you know, until we had human beings and that sort of thing. And somewhere along the way, when the things that it evolved were interesting enough that individuated units of consciousness could, uh, uh, what shall we say, uh, could experience the choices that they had to make in this simulation, that's when individuated units of consciousness began to use these evolved uh, avatars in this, in this virtual reality game, you see, as, as their own personal avatar. So now what are our bodies? Our bodies are just information. Our physical universe is information and individuated units of consciousness use our avatars, play our avatars just as we play the elf in World of Warcraft. We play World of Warcraft and we are the consciousness. Okay, so we're the consciousness for that elf. If that, you know, if we don't tell that elf to move, it just stands there. We tell it to run, to fight, to go forward, go backward, look right, look left, look up. It does whatever we tell it to because we're its consciousness. So the difference is, of course, World of Warcraft is a program game, whereas our virtual reality, our physical universe, is an evolved game. And with a player in World of Warcraft is also aware in its own reality such that, you know, you can put World of Warcraft on pause and go make a sandwich, you know, go have lunch, uh, go to school, come back, and it's still sitting there. Whereas in our system, uh, this individuated unit of consciousness takes a part of itself, a part that has no intellect, but it has all of the potential of the parent being, of the individuated unit of consciousness, has all that potential, just doesn't have an intellect, and it logs in, connects to an avatar, and then it starts getting the avatar's experience, just like we get the elf's experience. We see what the elf sees. We hear what the elf hears. It sees and hears and feels and smells whatever the avatar does according to the simulation. And it then learns. That's its world. It's completely immersed in the sense data of the avatar and it interprets that sense data as this reality. Okay, it learns that uh what this reality is as an infant, how to 
interpret that sense data. So what we have then is basically a computer in consciousness as a, as a part of a larger conscious system creating a virtual reality and an and a individuated unit of conscious or a piece of it that I call the free will awareness unit that is trading data with the computer. And that's it. Our physical reality is just ones and zeros, just numbers in a computer. We are consciousness, and we have a data stream coming from the server that's serving this, up this game, the computer, and that gives us a data stream that we interpret as this reality. Just like the computer running World of Warcraft sends us a data stream, it lights up pixels on our, on our uh, monitor, and we interpret those pixels as the World of Warcraft world. So it works very much the same way. So then that, that brings us to what are we? We are, we are free will awareness units. We are playing a game with a virtual body, a virtual avatar. It's, our purpose is to lower our entropy. And I think I, I mentioned before in the first one, you can equate lowering entropy with cooperation, caring about other, which we call love. Yes. So yes. that's our, that's our point here is to become love. It's why we exist. Our reality exists. Our universe exists because we needed a better, uh, we needed context for our choices. We can make, we're free will. We may, we have free will. We're consciousness. We make choices. But, uh, in that big chat room atmosphere, our choices had no, had no traction. There's, there's no context for them. There's no, there's much, not much you can learn that way. Whereas in our world, our choices, you know, we are, we, we become the sum total of all of our choices. So it's, uh, those, those choices are very solid now. They're very, uh, you know, tractable. It's something that we, we can grow. So that's our point. Lower our entropy, become love. And that's what the universe is. It's a virtual reality and consciousness is an information system that evolved from a simple, awareness that could determine that it was in one two sets we've also decided that time is fundamental and uh, space of course is not space you create space by defining an origin and three mutually perpendicular coordinates that's a 3d space and from then on that defines space space is just a is just mathematics it's just a number so that's uh, that's kind of in a nutshell, our, our worldview, a little short summary there over where we, where we are and how we get there. So uh, why is it that every single time someone or something presents the meaning of life to us that we resist it? We, oh, it can't be that. It must be something else. Why do we wrestle with these questions? Why are you and I having this conversation? Why can't we just be like bacteria and just go along to get along? Is there a, a, a function, a purpose, perhaps in an evolutionary context here? You know, why do, why do I lie awake at night asking these questions? I mean, does it, does it serve me, you, or, or everything to do that? Sure. Well, that's because you have free will. You know, when you have free will, you have to assess the information that you've got and decide on what your next choice is going to be. And you evolve or de-evolve based on the quality of that choice. So we get information. Okay, you just heard of a, of a, what I just told you. That's why we're here is to become love. But for you to use that, you have to be able to, you know, make choices based on that. You have to be willing to do that. And maybe you're not willing yet because that's a possibility. You know, you say that could be that way, but maybe it's some other way. I don't know yet. So that's the nature of free will, that it uh, needs to gather information to make its, you know, its best choice. And it never has all the information it, it needs. So your choices are almost never logical. They have to do with take a bunch of information and then most of us kind of go with our intuition or we go with our beliefs. So if you have beliefs that are contrary to that, then you just blow all that off and go follow your beliefs. If, uh, you know, if not, you have to look at the whole idea, look at the whole theory, say, of in my big toe, and say, does it make sense? Does it answer the data? Does it explain my experiences, my subjective experiences? 
And if it explains most everything, then that gives you credibility that it might, in fact, be true. If it doesn't explain everything, then it might, in fact, be not true. So every individual has to come to that kind of decision on their own. And that's why it's a very slow process with we humans. Bacteria didn't have all that intellectual agonizing to do. Uh, their, their decision space, their free will, if you want to call it free will, but their, you know, what they could do or not do was pretty much hardwired. They didn't have a lot of uh, uh, decision space. They may have had none at all. It may just have been hardwired and, and randomness, uh, what do we call it, uh, um, permutations and uh, of all the possibilities. They had, uh, you know, chance things happened and the things that worked went on so you don't really need consciousness at such a simple level all you need is is a process that moves on but when we get up to humans and other things humans aren't the only ones that are conscious you know dogs and cats and bumblebees and all sorts of things have consciousness just at different levels um, anyway we have this we have this ability even responsibility to come to our own conclusions so that takes a while we're we're slow at this so everything doesn't think it's the center of everything. If <laughs> that doesn't sound too <laughs> circular, <laughs> no, it's the thing you have. That's one of the things you learn that you are not the center of the universe. That you are not the center of uh, of of all reality. That you are one among many, and that the best and most profitable way that you can interact with this many is by being cooperative, so that it's win-win. If you are an entity, a one among many, and what your philosophy is to grab as much as you can grab and, and then hold on to it, um, you will find that your life is a is a impoverished one. That you are not a very happy camper. That it's a it's a very um, dysfunctional existence. Whereas a cooperative entity um, finds that life is is uh, very functional. Things work work well. So that's you know we just we just all have to figure it out for ourselves. It's a it's an individual thing. Each unit of consciousness is a is an individual with free will, and they have to figure it out for themselves. And then as long as they are the center of the universe and everything is about them, then they will be extremely limited into how much they can lower their entropy. So it, we just slowly figure it out as each one of us uh, you know gets it and begins to. Uh, decrease our entropy and and of course the rewards are very obvious once you start down that path your life gets fun it gets to be really uh, a lot of joy and it is not the struggle that most people find themselves in we struggle because we have fear ego beliefs that's what creates all the struggle and dysfunction once we let go of that stuff then uh life gets really good and uh, a lot of fun and very satisfying. So the rewards are, are, are there. That's what this learning, uh, that's what the schoolhouse is all about. We just have to, we just have to grow up. So uh, do you think we're uh, on track or off track? Do you know, if you see what I mean, that the struggle that you describe, is that ultimately kind of, you know, this had to happen or, uh, you know, have we lost our way? And even if we've done that, you know, maybe that's a, a process in itself that, that has to take place. Sure, I think that's the process in itself. I mean, we we uh, we have come a long way. We have been evolving. This is a much kinder, gentler world for for probably the majority of people in it than it was, say, 300 years ago. See, we lived through times when this was a you know it was all one could do just to survive long enough to procreate. Right? That was times were very hard. It was very difficult to uh, get by. A lot of violence, a lot of um, you know low entropy activity going on, and that's better. It's not uh, you know it's not that way anymore for a large part of our population. So that's progress. We're making progress, but at the same time, just you know dial in any news you know, news station or uh, read the paper, and you will see that we have a long, long way to go. This society is not exactly built on love and caring about other. You know, it's still a mostly self-centered, uh, um, me at the center kind of a place. So we've got a long way to go. This schoolhouse is not a graduate school or a college or even a high school. It's more 
like uh, elementary school. You know, so we are just still struggling our way up that ladder of lower entropy. Eventually, we will get there because even if we have setbacks, even if the entropy rises for a time, it will go back because that's what evolution does. That's the, that's the function of evolution. It takes change that decreases entropy and goes on with it. So we may be another million years struggling, but eventually we will slowly climb that hill and get there because that's the nature of evolution. So we can self-destruct and, you know, uh, have World War III and wipe out two-thirds of the population. Well, that's a setback, but that evolution just keeps on chugging. It deals with what it has to deal with, and eventually we will uh, regain and, and uh, make progress. So it's just where we are. Now, we could, if we all understood what we were doing here, we could, you know, uh, speed this up a whole lot. We could make more progress in, in six months than we've made in, you know, 100,000 years. But we'd have to intentionally want to do it at the individual level. We have to grow up. So we can speed it up dramatically or we can drag it out dramatically. It is just our choice, our free will choice, our collective choice. So the world you see out there and the state of it, that's the world we have created through our choices. And it reflects the quality of us, the quality of our consciousness, the, the amount of entropy that is, that is uh, in our individual consciousnesses. So that's, you know, you look out there and say, wow, this place is really, uh, you know, rotten or something. Well, that's the way we are. It's a perfect representation of the way we are. And we look at our institutions and people find problems with the institutions. Uh, the, you know, it's the politicians. It's the, you know, it's the corporations. It's the rich people. It's all these people that are the problem. But these people represent us. They are picked from us. You know, they are human beings like us too. Um, the, the big, difference between them and us is they have the power so that their free will has a lot of leverage not power and we don't have much power so our free will just kind of affects us and a few other people theirs affects maybe hundreds of thousands of other people but basically they're just like us so that'll all change the institutions and the people that run them will change as we change they're a reflection of us so they're a symptom of our low quality of consciousness so we can go in and get rid of that dictator and make these laws, and we can change that structure, but all we're doing is changing the symptom. We're fixing a symptom. The cause is low quality of consciousness, and that has to be fixed one person at a time. Each person has to fix their own. So until we fix that, until we actually address the cause, which is the low quality of consciousness, then this other stuff will just always be there. So we can get rid of this dictator and we can make those laws, but eventually it'll all end up about the same as it was before, just different. It won't really get much better. And we can see that in history. You know, you get rid of one dictator, replace him with another dictator, and so on. You know, it's just the way it is because that's what we, the people, create because that's our quality. So if we get rid of you know, the fear, get rid of the ego, get rid of the beliefs, then those institutions and, and uh, you know, power structures would become more represent, representative of us and they would be kinder and gentler just as we become kinder and gentler. So we need to focus on the cause, not on the symptoms. We need to actually do both, you know, try to fix the symptoms and fix the cause together. But if we just fix symptoms, it won't, it'll be a short-term uh, solution and not a long-term solution. I guess this is where the idea of uh, evil comes from, or Tico, well, as the Native Americans call it. You know, it's actually, uh, we're reflecting back on ourselves, aren't we really? Sort of thing. Yes. The reason you have to, the reason you have evil is that you have free will. You get to make choices and you can make bad choices and you can continue to make bad choices and that's, you know, the difference between good and bad is that good is something that decreases the entropy of the individual and the system, and bad is something that increases it, and that evil is, you know, very high entropy and good is low entropy. So that's, that's the difference. And you have free will. You can't say, well, everybody has free will as long as they do what I want. 
you know, that's not free will. It's everybody has free will, period, so they can de-evolve and become a part of the problem, you know, be, uh, have a high entropy, you know, become evil, or they can uh, evolve positively and become part of the solution, or they can just muddle around in the middle doing a little bit of each and uh, stay a part of the problem. I love the idea that, that stems from your, how can I put it, I want to say worldview, that sounds too small, but you know, your overall concepts that we mentioned earlier about us uh, not being the center of everything, it really changes the context, doesn't it, um, about you know what we're doing and why we're doing it, that if when, you know, if the sun goes supernova and burns out and the earth is reduced to ashes, <laughs> that it isn't the end of everything. And uh, if we had that humility that would come from that thought, it, I don't know, but it would put everything in perspective, I think, really. And that uh, it, it, if we are just a little, you know, pinhead somewhere in a process, as opposed to being what it's all about, um, that that in itself, I think, would change a lot of things about how we see ourselves and the bigger picture, how we interact with each other and everything that is. Yes, absolutely. I think so, too. We're important, each and every one of us. You know, we are a piece of this consciousness system. And as such, we have, you know, like in all fractal situations, you know, the pieces have the, have the, the content of the whole. So we have the ability, we have the, um, uh, the what do we should say, the fundamental potential of the whole within us. So we evolve, as we evolve, it evolves. We are its strategy for evolution. So here we are, all these little pieces in this virtual reality making choices, and those choices either lower our entropy or raise it. Every time our entropy is lowered and we evolve, our quality of consciousness becomes greater. The system, the larger consciousness system, has a decrease in entropy too because we're it, it's us. We evolve, it evolves. So we are a very important part of this system in that we are you know, a part of its strategy to survive, to continue ev evolving. So we are very important. We're not just little uh, throwaway, uh, you know, uh, items in a in a huge picture. We're very important to the to the working and the survival of the entire system. So that makes us, uh, you know, sound important. On the other hand, we're not the only virtual reality universe. There are others. And, you know, we are immortal consciousness. Our virtual bodies, our avatars, of course, they just, you know, they get old and die because that's what the rule set says happens. So they go, and then we go get another avatar. And then when that one dies, we go get another avatar. So we just keep going round and round doing our job of lowering entropy. And uh, the system keeps on chugging because we succeed. So that's, that's the idea. Now, this is a virtual reality with our physical universe. So if our physical universe burns up because the sun explodes or because, you know, we explode it with, uh, you know, our, our chemicals and our pollution and, you know, we kill everything ourselves, this is a virtual reality. You can always go back to the last time it was working well and start over there. You see, you can always, uh, you know, develop another virtual reality. So it's not like death or you know what happens here physically has a real major fundamental importance it doesn't death is is uh, you know insignificant in a big picture and this you know the fact that the sun will blow up one day and this uh, universe will all end up as hydrogen gas and elementary particles is this no big deal it's just a virtual reality game and it can always be restarted it can always be started over, you know, at any particular place or point or time. You can branch from it. Digital systems are highly flexible. So we shouldn't take ourselves uh, quite so seriously in one way because we are immortal pieces of consciousness, not, not bodies. And we should take ourselves seriously in that we've got a job to do here. We are supposed to be lowering our entropy. If not, we're not, you know, kind of doing our part for the, for the system that we're a part of. So that kind of puts us in perspective. And suddenly the physical becomes not all that important in the big picture view. And 
whether or not we're making good choices becomes very important in that big picture view. So I wonder why we want to make it. I, I know I alluded this to I alluded to this in a couple of my previous points, but why we want to make it all so tawdry, and why some people want to portray, for example, what you know your ideas in religious terms, and just sort of like dismiss it. You know, why is it we we seem so desperate to be you know to be not transcendent? <laughs> Well, that's, that's a, in psychology, they, they call that uh, cognitive dissonance. When you've invested in an idea and an approach, when you're invested in your beliefs, and you don't want to hear anything different, you've got an investment, and even when that investment doesn't work and another way looks better, you stick with it because you throw good after bad just because otherwise you'd have to admit that you have been throwing good after bad, but you can just keep doing it and pretend that uh, it's, you know, you're on the right track. That's called cognitive dissonance. It's just the just the way we are. We don't like to uh, we don't like change, and we don't like to admit we're wrong. So we just keep on keeping on. Yeah. As far as this is a religion, it was a really big surprise to me coming coming from many many years of of being uh, you know anti religion and and atheist and that sort of thing, it surprised me when this logic told me that a lot of the fundamental truths of, of the world's religions turned out to be right. You know, the, the fundamental ideas turned out to be right. Now, there's a lot of nonsense there as well, and a lot of dogma and, and that kind of stuff, which of course is, is not valuable at all. It's counterproductive. And a lot of religions kind of define themselves on their creeds and their dogma and their beliefs and all that stuff, which is dysfunctional. But the basic ideas, God is love, uh, uh, Buddhism, uh, we live, uh, uh, you know, our, our reality is illusion. You know, that's all, you know, those are fundamental ideas and they're right. You know, we, uh, becoming love is our purpose. Um, our fundamental reality is a virtual reality. It isn't you know, what we think it is. So we can look at these ideas and say, wow, these guys really had some inkling of what they were talking about. They had connected to the larger consciousness system, just as thousands and thousands of people have, brought back some of these ideas. And then, unfortunately, a lot of them got, uh, you know, wrapped around all sorts of uh, dogmas and other belief systems and ways to bring in money and, you know, increase... uh, Increased membership and other sorts of things started to get added to them, but you have some some good basic uh, understandings that come out of religion. Now, mine, you know, sometimes some people call the larger consciousness system God, but it's just a natural system. It's a natural system like any other natural system. It's not infinite. It's finite. It's not perfect. Uh, you know it. Uh, it has rules, and sometimes they're disobeyed, and nothing happens. You know, it's just a, a, a system that is trying to get along and survive and uh, lower its entropy, and that's it. So there's nothing uh, uh, mystical or, you know, <laughs> religious about it. It's just, it's science. It's just a, a uh, you know, well, I keep saying the words, you know, it's just a natural system. It isn't any any different. So... You can call that God if it uh, if that makes you feel better, or you can just think of it as uh, as, the, as the nature of our reality. I love this idea. Again, it comes up in your view of reality about infinity or finity. <laughs> the <laughs> idea of it, of everything being finite. We talked earlier about uh, you know limitations to knowledge and that there's a beyond and there's a beyond beyond. But what's behind that? You know and the the origin of everything and has there, does nothing exist? Has something always existed? And you posit that, um, even in your view of things as it currently stands, that that's not necessarily infinite. Even that in itself, in our tiny little monkey brains, is difficult to come to terms with the idea that, uh, whatever there is isn't infinite. And even, I suppose the idea of something always existing, um, the idea of nothing, we can put up there with the idea of infinity. I mean, what does that look like as well? You know, how can something go on for everything? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. uh, how can something go on forever? Yeah, well, that's the, you know, people, as long as you use the word infinite just to mean 
something really, really big, then it's a good metaphor. But if infinite actually means infinite, you know, and not just very, very big, nothing real can be infinite. If it's real and consciousness is real, then it has to be finite. Infinity is a it's concept. It's an idea, and it's a concept that can never be reached. That's why, you know, in mathematics, you use infinity a lot, but you approach infinity. You get asymptotic, you know, to, you know, as you go out infinity. And time, you know, forever doesn't actually exist as a state. It's just that evolution is open-ended. You know, evolution doesn't have an endpoint. It just keeps on evolving. Now, we say that it evolves forever. Well, you know, that's our projection. It basically just keeps on cranking. It's an open-ended process that doesn't have a, it doesn't have a part where it says, ah, I'm done, you know. It's never done. There's always change in such a complex system that can be made. So there's always ways to improve. It's just, it's a system that doesn't, uh, that doesn't stop. Well, that doesn't mean it goes on forever, except, you know, in, in a theoretical sense. You know, so we can we can think of those in a theoretical sense, but we talk about real systems. Now that's practical; it's real, and it has to be finite, and it just keeps on keeping on, and that's all we can can say about it. You know, an infinite system is problematical. You know, it takes infinite energy and infinite. You know, you have all sorts of things that now have to be infinite, and nothing is infinite. Everything real must be finite. So this system is finite, and what does that mean? It means it has limits. It has boundaries. I would imagine it only has so many bits that it can that it can create. So there, are, it only has so much throughput. It can only compute so quickly. You see, it's got its its own limitations. It's not infinite in anything it does. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a real system. It'd be an imaginary system. Infinity is a is an idea. It's a concept. Something that we can approach but it doesn't actually exist. And in math class, they, they tell you that. They say, you know, there is, you can never get to infinity. Infinity won't exist because infinity then is, just, is the largest number. You can't get a number any bigger than infinity. Well, if it's a real number, you can always add one to it. Well, then it wasn't infinite, was it? You see, there's, there's just no way that you can get to the largest number because you can always add something to it. So it's just a concept. It's a very abstract concept, but not a real concept thing and forever is the same way it's a it's an abstract concept but it doesn't apply to something real wonderful well tom thank you so much for joining us once again on legalizefreedom.com uh, as i say this is part two of a uh, unfolding series we today we've been discussing some of the ideas in your trilogy uh, awakening discovery and inner workings otherwise known as my big toe toe being theory of everything um, just before we end, uh, just share with listeners uh, your website and anything else you'd like to put out there. Okay. Uh, if you are interested in, in what uh, we're talking about, you can find more on the subject uh, several places. One would be a good place to start would be my website, which is www.mybigtoe.com. Um, the other, and from there, I guess you can you can get to the YouTube site, uh, which is, uh, you know, www.youtube.com slash TWCJR44. And that would take you to that website. Or you can just Google Thomas Campbell or Google My Big Toe, and that will lay out, you know, up on the first page, we'll, we'll lay out all these sites as well. Uh, if you want to know where I might be giving talks, you can go to um, MBT Events. That's www.mbtevents. Dot com. So those are the those are the places. The books are for free on Google Books, and uh, that's where you can that's where you can find out more. And more stuff goes up all the time. There's many interviews. I got a main. Uh, I just did a big uh, workshop in Marseille, France, that uh, should be coming uh, up on the on YouTube and maybe through a couple of months. So stuff keeps changing, and uh, more stuff keeps coming up. So. Come join us in any of these sites. Oh, one other. You, we have a, a forum, and there's some very knowledgeable people on this forum who can answer your questions. So if you have a, a specific question where you come to a, a point where it just doesn't make sense to you, oh, yeah, but what about what? You know, what about this? You know, it just doesn't, uh, 
doesn't make sense to me. Well, if you have a question like that, go to the forum. That's uh, that's at uh, on the website. You'll see you'll either see forum or discussion group or something like that. Click in there and sign up, and uh, you'll get your questions answered there, uh, very uh, very expertly. Wonderful. Well, thank you once again, uh, Tom, for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. My pleasure, Greg. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's LegalizeFreedom.com, Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com. <laughs>